जय राधा कुंज भी हे Hare 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 Ram 
Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Viranta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gorvani Pachari Ne Nirise Sasunya Vyadi Bastyatya De Sitari Ne Omagyan Timirandasya Ganajana Salakaya Chaksu Un Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Veda Maha Sri Chaitanya Manobistam Stapti Tamye Nabutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swa Padantikam Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Siadvaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So I thought I'd speak about book distribution since we have entered into the marathon. Uh, from what I understand, there is a worldwide marathon going on entitled Live to Give. Um, each temple around the world has a quota and the goal is two million Bhagavad Gita's. That's the goal collectively around the world for this particular marathon. Just a little bit of history so we will, can understand the value, the importance, and the supreme position of book distribution amongst all the forms of preaching. Um, and this has been directly mentioned by Srila Prabhupada in many of his lectures. But we take back the history of our society and we go to when Srila Prabhupada was with his Guru Maharaj Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. In 1936, when he met him at Radhakund, and uh, Bhakti Siddhanta had a very uh, worried look on his face, and you can see there was a picture drawn of Prabhupada along with his son, Vrindavan, and uh, um, Bhakti Siddhanta. They're walking together in the area of Radhakund. Uh, the look on Bhakti Siddhanta's face reflects something that was happening in the Gaudiya Math. And what that was, was there was a uh, very rich uh, merchant who was also a follower of Bhakti Siddhanta, 
who felt very charitable and practically exhausted all his wealth and uh, had this building constructed for the devotees to live in, which was a multi-story building with made out of marble, very nice plush rooms, very first class. Prior to that, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's disciples were either traveling most of the time and living wherever they were traveling, or they were just living very simply. Now they had this palatial building, and um, it was quite opulent. But what the problem came was that the devotees were fighting over the rooms. Before there was more of a unity amongst the devotees, but ever since opulence came in, then there was a little struggle amongst the devotees on which, where, who should have what room like that. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati saw that this was, you know, really making a, a fracture in his movement. So he became very concerned. So when he was talking with Arshila Prabhupada, he said, Agun Jualbe, there's fire in the moth. That means there is difficulty in the society. And he talked about the building, and then he said, you know, if I had my way, he said, I would take the marble off the world and sell it and print books. And then he turned to Srila Prabhupada and he said, if you ever get money, print books. He says, this is the, the Brihat Murdanga. Uh, the Murdanga, when you play it, it can be heard within a range. But the Brihat Murdanga, the great Murdanga, can travel anywhere and anywhere and go all over the world. So the printing press and book distribution is the Brihat Madanga. And um, what we have is what people really need most in anything, and that is the the direction in life where they can find peace and happiness and ultimately success in their relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And so Prabhupada took that into his heart in a very deep way, and may he made his one of his main features of his movement uh, the printing and distributing of books. And he made that, in fact, he put it on the top of the list as far as activities concerned. And he also said that. He said, out of all forms of preaching, book distribution is the best. He said, what will your three-minute speech do? But if they get a book, their life can be changed. <laughs> so... Prabhupada noted how the communist movement around the world had become somewhat uh, proliferated, grown in numbers because they did a lot of propaganda of their literature and they placed literature everywhere and anywhere. So Prabhupada thought this is what we should do. We should just distribute books anywhere and everywhere and depend on Krishna and and that way, this information will get out. And so, today, to date, that is up until today, we are scratching the 600 million mark as far as distributed books. Um, of course, that's not the highest in the world. The Christians have us beaten with their Bible. <laughs> they have distributed more than that. But the point is that 600 million is a pretty amazing number considering how long we've been in existence. That's only been in the last 50 years or so. And book distribution really didn't start to really flourish until 1974. Before then, things were happening on a small, very small scale, but in 74, things took off. And then that was the beginning of the Christmas Marathon. Because devotees got the idea that people around all over America were shopping for Christmas. And so the stores and malls and streets were filled with people going out and buying presents. So the idea of uh, Christmas Marathon became uh, a way to uh, you know, really emphasize book distribution. So devotees did that in 1974. I think they distributed close to two million books in that one year. But then 
Prabhupada, when he got the totals, he was, of course, very inspired, but he said, next year, double it. <laughs> so in 1975, they doubled it. And then when he got the totals in 75, he said, next year, you double it. <laughs> Prabhupada was always seeing the enthusiastic devotees and how they were well surrendering everything. So he kept pushing that that I that 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 movement. And devotees were you know, during the marathon they were spending the whole day out. After breakfast they would go out and stay up to midnight. This was towards the the part the time of when Christmas was happening. They would come in at midnight, take a little bit of prasadam, take rest, get up the next morning, chant their rounds, and go out again for the whole day. So it was like that. It was an intense, like... Uh, and, and and of course, this led to statements like one, one congressman said that if this Krishna consciousness movement ex keeps expanding the way it is, it will take over the government of the United States in 10 years. That's a statement from a, a politician because book distribution was, was really like everywhere in the schools, in the, sh in the streets, everywhere. So we've had some amazing, uh, uh, what we say, success in reaching people with book distribution. And uh, so I just wanted to emphasize the importance of book distribution because um, <clears throat> it's very dear to the heart of Srila Prabhupada. But the thing is that people are looking for some solution to their suffering. I think now, with the present situation we have, world pandemic, people are more likely to be open to a wider range of ideas in order to give they give themselves some some activities, some entertainment, or even some some solutions to their problems. I was just talking to one devotee here who does uh, welfare work, and she meets people all the time now who are coming with psychological problems, and a lot of their problems are due to the fact that they're losing <coughs> their money, they're losing their homes, they're losing their places of residence. <clears throat> so there's an economic crisis that is pushing people against the wall now. And so people are starting to look for alternatives. But of course the solution is not juggling the economics. The solution is changing the mindset and how to deal with this situation. So we have the solution. And that's Prabhupada's books. Because Prabhupada's speaking directly the words of Lord Krishna through his books. So when we're distributing books, we're actually giving people uh, Krishna directly through the words of the great soul, such as Srila Prabhupada. And therefore, we're doing the highest welfare work that can be done. So to inspire devotees, we need to understand that uh, what we're giving is not coming from us. It's not just a book, and it's not a bunch of philosophy and a some spiritual ideas. It's actually a means for solving the, everyone's problems completely and eternally. In other words, once they, once they come to Krishna consciousness, then all their problems are solved. So we should be thinking how to distribute books during this marathon. Of course, I think the devotees here are a little bit adventurous. From what I heard, they're not going to relegate themselves simply to the the media through the for distributing. The devotees are here are going to be a little bit adventurous. From what I heard, right? And and that's good. That's how Krishna consciousness spread. Because if we followed all the rules to society, we would never be what we are now. <laughs> you have to take a a leap of faith sometimes and go out on a limb and take risks for Krishna. <laughs> and so that's just like we have the example of how practically the whole Russian, Russian Yatra started when Prabhupada, through Sham Sundar, his secretary, arranged for Prabhupada to come to Russia in 1971. 
And at that time, the communist countries were really strong, especially Russia. Um, Prabhupada was somewhat invited through this Hindu society as an emissary of Bhakti Yoga. So Prabhupada came. He was supposed to meet and come to this society. He did meet one person as a representative, and that was Professor Katowski, and that that's discussion is recorded. But coming into Russia, it was understood and communicated that no religious material should come in. So the devotees made sure, but what Malati, Shamasundar's wife, did is she put a Bhagavad Gita inside of Shamasundar's suitcase without him knowing it. And inside the Bhagavad Gita was a bunch of papers and pictures and different pages. So when they went through customs, the immigration officer was opening the luggage and he saw the Gita and he looked at it and he said, what is this? And then uh, uh, I heard two different accounts of what happened. One account I heard was that he picked up the Bhagavad Gita and dropped it. And when he dropped it, all the pages went out, all the papers. So he became a little flustered. And he picked up all the paper, put it back, put the Bhagavad Gita back in the suitcase. The other story I heard is that he called the police, and the police came over, and they said, doesn't seem to be so bad. <laughs> so they let the Bhagavad Gita in, and that Bhagavad Gita was given to one devotee, who later became Ananta Shanti, the first disciple of Srila Prabhupada in Russia. And uh, the devotees in those days, of course, Russia and Moscow was a very poor country at that time. Moscow especially. People had to stand in line for the basic foods that they needed. There was hardly anything available. There was hardly any food available. The only food that was available was uh, some milk and some uh, meat, I think. <laughs> it's hard to get anything. If you could find sugar, you were lucky. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so once the, the Gita got in, uh, it was copied. When Krishna consciousness went underground and the Nanta Shakti started to meet people and preach about Krishna consciousness, a little group started to formulate. And they had that one Bhagavad Gita, but people wanted copies, but there was no way to copy it. There was no facility for printing at all. And if they could, that would be a risk. So what they did was they copied it by hand, the whole Gita. And that's if you wanted it, if you wanted your own copy, you could take, take that one copy and copy it by hand. <laughs> that's how you had it. And devotees did that. And sometimes I was hearing they were spending their whole month's salary practically and getting one copy of Bhagavad Gita. It was difficult. So that one Gita actually, you know, turned into many Gitas and then gradually the underground movement, which was underground for many years, uh, started to spread. Devotees were persecuted. Some were killed, put in jail, put in concentration camps, put in uh, psychiatric hospitals, tortured. and uh, But still the movement grew. There's an old saying, if you want to spread a, you want to spread a religion, persecute it. <laughs> That's true. That's why they don't persecute us, because they know it'll spread. <laughs> yeah, that's true. If you, want to, if you want a religion to spread, persecute it, then it gains so much support when people are persecuted, and then it becomes bigger and more popular. If you really want to sell a book, put a sign on it, this book is banned, no one should read it. <laughs> Same way. As soon as you restrict something, it becomes popular. <laughs> so that was a, a story, one of the landmark stories out of all the stories of how a book distribution really started 
And I think many of us, and of course devotees all around the world, many of us, uh, it was cause, because of a book that somehow or other be, we became connected to Krishna consciousness. I remember in 1970, I was in uh, Washington, D.C. Mm. I was a political activist at the time. Uh, amongst all of my other misdeeds. <laughs> and I was there at an anti-war rally in 1970 in Washington, D.C. I saw the devotees for the first time. They were dressed in their robes. And I was thinking, this looks a little strange. And then one the one young girl, real small little tiny Brahmacharini, I guess, she came up to me and she had a Bhagavad Gita I'm sorry, Back to Godhead magazine and some incense. And that's what they were selling in those days. There was no books. That was 1970. So she came up to me and she started speaking. And, and I don't remember what we, she said, but she gave she handed me the Back to Godhead. Actually, it wasn't a Back to Godhead. No, it was a pamphlet which had two lectures in it. And the lectures were... Uh, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and who is crazy? Prabhupada had written this article, Who is Crazy? Because people were saying, you guys are crazy. And then Prabhupada said, you say we crazy, we're crazy, and we say you're crazy, so let's discuss. <laughs> so crazy means you don't know who you are. <laughs> so that's a sign of insanity. If you think you're this body, that that means you're you're crazy, because <laughs> it's not you. <laughs> so that pamphlet was circulated along with the incense. So I remember, I took out my fifty cents. I had two fifty cents, and I gave it to the girl, and she said, "No, two dollars, please." <laughs> my first encounters with the Hari Krishnas. <laughs> So she was not going to let me go. <laughs> so I gave her two dollars. That was a lot in those days. <laughs> it was like twenty bucks today. <laughs> and then I sat on the bus going back to my home in New Jersey from D.C. It was like a four or five hour bus ride. And I read both of the, the, the pamphlet. I didn't understand anything. <laughs> Put it in my desk drawer. And, that, and then two years later, I met the devotees again. So the seed was planted, and then, so yeah, so that was in one of the, I was one of the persons who got some literature. So I think a lot of devotees may, may have received a book. And uh, that brought them to the temple, brought them in the association with devotees. So these books are powerful. I was just talking to Mukunda Prabhu just before the class and he was mentioning how we, we distributed one book to one person when we were going from my residency about a m month ago. And now she's reading it and she likes it and she's commented on it and she's met another devotee since then. Was it you she met? Yeah, in Hamanga Gopi she met and she was... To saying how much she reads a little bit of it every day and she's getting a lot from it. So, so these books are really powerful. Um, I can say here in Slovenia, it's, you've, you've all done a wonderful job every year distributing books. Because your country is so small, I think you've told me that every person in the country has gotten a book, right? <laughs> Almost. Yeah, so that's good. You want to keep giving them the books until they they finally surrender. <laughs> that's the idea. I told one story today, and I'll tell it again. How the devotees in Chelpati were distributing books for the Christmas marathon in the train station train station in uh, Mumbai, uh, Rajapati. Shivaji train station. <laughs> and um, so the devotees were out and full. And uh, one man, he's walking along. He's approached by one devotee. 
He says, no, thank you, I'm not interested. He goes on. So he's walking, and he's walking on the train station. Another devotee comes up to him, approaches him again, same man. He again waves him away. And then he's walking and walking, and then the third devotee, of course none of the devotees knew he was approached previously, and the third devotee went up to him, and then he said, well, I think God wants me to get this book. So <laughs> the third time he bought the book. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, it was. I have to tell this one story. What is the record for book distribution in one day by one person? It was done by one devotee in Chaupati Temple. Her name was Radhika. R yeah, Radhika. She did 12,000 Bhagavad Gita's in one day. <laughs> 12,000 Bhagavad Gita's in one day. <laughs> she went into one factory, talked to the owner of the factory. He became so inspired that he bought 12,000 Gita's for the entire, uh, for entire employees of the whole factory. <laughs> so everybody in the whole factory got Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> so yeah, she was also number one that year for book distribution, I remember. So yeah. This is a wonderful culture, this distributing of transcendental literature. There's such a higher taste that comes from this service that once one starts to develop it, one will think, there's no other service I want to do. It's such a sweet taste. Uh, it's a challenge, and of course the weather is always against you in terms of... But still, um, devotees find it, they, they, they want to please Srila Prabhupada. So that's the thing, Prabhupada's pleased. When Prabhupada was leaving the world in his last days when he was in Vrindavan, he wasn't really doing a lot, but one thing he wanted was the devotees to give him the book scores for around the world every month. And then when he would hear the scores, he would say, this body is dead, but this is giving me life. <laughs> this is life. When he would hear how the devotees were distributing thousands of books, Prabhupada would just be so happy, so enlivened that, the, that Krishna consciousness was going on in such a powerful way. So we have this, these programs now. Plug into the program and try to distribute as much books as possible. I think you'll find that people are mo more receptive right now than ever before. Well, this is my feeling, and I'm, from what I hear, it's like that. Um, because uh, there's a kind of a desperation in, the, in society. Everyone is thinking <clears throat> this pandemic will end soon. And they're not only, well, maybe they're not thinking, but they're really hoping. But forget it. <laughs> if we ha we're not depending on, you know, the so-called future that, was, that will come based on what we had in the past. The past is not going to come back the way it was. We're in a different zone now. So now we have to live in this situation and adjust and adopt, but keep keep the fire of Krishna consciousness going and not worry about all the restrictions and whatever else is happening in the world because it doesn't affect us in the real sense of the word. Our work goes on. We preach. We have kirtan. We, uh, we distribute books. We worship the Lord. Nothing changes. <laughs> Maybe it's a little less, little, little bit more restrictive, but at the same time, the same activities go on. Okay, so these are some, and there's many, many wonderful stories about book distribution. I mean, there are books written about it. And, uh, there's one particular book that if you haven't read it, please get it. It's called Our Family Business by uh, Vaisheshika Prabhu, 
Bhai Shakespeare Prabhu is a very senior Prabhupada disciple. He's been in a movement since the early 70s and he's been doing books distribution since then. That's been his only service, he distributing books. He also was managing a temple for a while along with distributing books. But he goes around the world giving book distribution seminars. He gives online videos about the importance of distributing Prabhupada's books. And he's put together this book, Our Family Business. It's a really thick book. I read it a few years ago. It's got everything and more about book distribution. A lot of the history, a lot of the statements about Prabhupada, and a lot of the uh, amazing stories that have come out of book distribution. It is one particular story, I can tell you, where one devotee was distributing Bhagavad Gita's in New York City, and he met a small little group of Burmese doctors. So he was saying, well, this book, in this book, there's a, there's talks, there, this is about Buddhism. Because they were Burmese doctors and they were kind of like into Buddhism. So they said, oh, Buddhism, okay. So they bought the book, took it back to their hotel room, and then they, th and they went looking through the book and then they realized it wasn't about Buddhism. So they lost interest. So they thought, well, we have a friend back in Burma. He's a Hindu. Uh, he's one of our doctors. We'll give him the book when we go back. So they kept the book. When they went back to Burma, they met their doctor friend, gave it to him. He looked at it, but he was a Shankarite. He was a Mayavadi. <laughs> so he wasn't interested. He said, oh, this is about bhakti. So he was a doctor, so he took the book and put it just put it on a pile of some of his medical books in the corner. So his son, he was a young man going to college, and he wanted to learn English. So he's thinking, well, how can I learn English? Then he saw the Bhagavad Gita. So he thought, I'm going to read that book because it's in English, and then I'll learn English. <laughs> I'm going to teach myself English by reading this book. So after reading the first six chapters, he became a devotee. <laughs> And then he made his father a devotee. And now he's the leader in Burma, and he's opened up temples all over the place. And he's been preaching Krishna consciousness. He's one of the leaders there. Just by this one book that came from New York all the way to Burma. So you can see how the power of Prabhupada's words, they somehow take root. Uh, there, there's one story that I like to tell. And devotees in Italy were distributing books, and when the trains would stop for the for five minutes for passengers to get on and off, they would go on the trains and distribute books. So one girl went on the train. And there was one man there. She tried to give him a book, but he became very angry. He grabbed the book and then he pushed the girl out the door. And she fell onto the thing. But he kept the book anyway. He would So somehow he kept it and just was very abusive to the devotee. So not long after that, this same person came down with terminal cancer. And then he was thinking, oh my God, he's dying. So he's thinking, I need to find God now. So he went into his library and he was looking for the Bible but he picked up the Bhagavad Gita that he got from that girl on the train and he started reading it. <laughs> and, you know, now he's in a changed mind because he's dying of cancer. So he, uh, read the, he read the book and then he became completely changed. He just, everything that he read really talked to him directly. So now he wanted, he thought, I'm going to make this, this process my, my spiritual practice until I die. So then he found in the book there was a temple address. So he wanted to go to the temple to meet the devotees. And so when he knocked on the door, guess who opened the door? The same girl he pushed out the door. <laughs> and then when she opened the door, he was flat on the ground playing, paying full obeisances to her. You know? 
And then he came, and uh, of course she forgave him for whatever he did. And, uh, so yeah, and his life completely changed. At least whatever was left of his life he used to, be, to practice Krishna consciousness. So these books are quite amazing. You don't know who's going to get it, who's not going to get it. A lot of times the person who gets the book is not the person who benefits from the book. It's somebody in their family, a friend, or somebody who happens to see it. There was one devotee in Chicago. His father, he was sitting, he was just a regular man. He was sitting in the, his living room. His father was collecting all the old books in the, in the house, piling them in boxes and taking them to the bookstores. Because in America they have these used bookstores. You can bring books to uh, that are used to these stores. And they'll give you 50 cents or a dollar for the book. Or maybe you can take it and trade it for one of their books. They use all of them, and sometimes they get rare books, so they do that. So he was collecting the books, and, and when he was carrying out the box of books, there was the Bhagavad Gita on the top. So this man, his son, he saw it, and he, he came over, took the book, and started reading it. And then he got halfway through, and he really liked it. And then he was thinking, boy, this, this is really something I want to get into. So then he was trying to find out, well, who's behind these books? Who are these people? There was no information. So then he was walking down the street of maybe a few weeks later, and he got stopped by a book distributor. And then he was so happy because he connected it, and he, he said, oh, you're here. I've been, I read your book. Do you have a, a place here? He said, yeah, we have a temple here in Chicago. So he came. And I was the temple, the temple, uh, they called me the non-resident resident, because <laughs> I was supposed to be the resident, but I was never there. <laughs> but I was there this time. He came in and he started talking to me, and uh, he became really interested. And he said, you know, I heard about you have a farm community in West Virginia. I said, yes. He said, take me there. I said, I'm actually going there within a month or so. So you can come with me. So we drove together. I took him to New Vrindavan. And he stayed, joined, got initiated by Dhanavir Swami and became a devotee. <laughs> yeah, so and this, this is another one of the most, one of the many thousands of stories of how Prabhupada's books have changed people's lives completely. So I'll distribute books. Distribute books, distribute books, and read the books. <laughs> Prabhupada would admonish us, you're distributing my books, but you're not reading. <laughs> Somebody asks you, my dear sir, my dear madam, what is in the books? Well, we don't know. Our teacher, he writes and we sell, that's all. <laughs> Papa said, not like that. <laughs> you should know the books so when people ask, or you can also speak about the book like that in a very convincing way. Okay, so any comments or questions, book distribution? Hare Krishna. Uh, I was uh, wondering and also is inspired if uh, is there any chance to get the article of the uh, Krishna the Supreme Godhead and who is crazy? It's available. There's a pamphlet. And I actually have a copy of that in my library, but my library is in Croatia. So if I can get that pamphlet then I can we can have it photocopied yeah then afterwards I, I, I could or somebody else could translate it and maybe to use it like a promotion it's good yeah <clears throat> Radhanath Swami also told me that was one of the first things that he also received when he was meeting devotees he got that pamphlet too so yeah it's uh, <clears throat> 
It's got a colorful picture of Krishna on the cover. I know I have it in my library. And uh, one devotee is coming to see me from Croatia on Friday. So um, maybe I can ask, have him go into my library and bring the pamphlet. I'll try to find it. <clears throat> I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Yes, I mean, I'm Mangi Gopi. Thank you, Maharaj, for very inspiring class about this Sankirtan. It's very, very inspiring to hear um, this um, experience, your personal experience, and also um, from you to hear um, what Prabhupada instructed us. That's really amazing. And regarding your point, you said that you... Um, you have sent, uh, you feel that um, now people could be may maybe more open. Um, I talk with one devotee who also doing uh, book distribution, and because all this situation with uh, coronavirus uh, now skepticism increases, and this conspiracy theory theory also appeared. So someone is to be blamed. Who is guilty for this situation? And people are also a lot of they are skeptical now. So and they are also reserved with um, everything which comes new and then i um ask that devotee what what she does in this situation and she said uh, recently maybe i don't know 20 days ago she distributed a book and then uh, one person came and then he said no no i don't want that kind of of a books that boring books that boring spiritual books i just uh, reading this um uh, uh, science fiction, science fiction, and she said, "But I have one." And then she found this. Um, it was, I think, Beyond Birth and Death. And he opened and he saw Universal Form, and he said, "This sounds interesting. Okay, I will take it." So it was very. And um, she said, "So we need to find to try to feel the mood of the person and somehow add some spiritual to really convince them because of this skepticism. It's also a obstacle to to preaching to uh, to, uh, to Sankirtan. So um, can you also give some advice? What could be also helpful to somehow dispel this skepticism?" <laughs> Welcome to Slovenia. <laughs> um, hmm. Some advice. I've been trying to work on that since I've been here. <laughs> yeah, people are skeptical here. This is like the mood of Slovenia. But you have to work on them. If you work on them, they they change. I found that, you know, people don't take anything here. You know, they're very suspicious and skeptical. So it takes a lot of work to get through. <laughs> but if you work at it, then, and you can convince, because people here are intelligent, but they're skeptical. At least this is the mood of Slovenia. Good intelligence, but don't believe anything. <laughs> so, so it takes a little work to get through. But if you can convince them by by their intelligence, they will they will change. When you come in Bosnia, it's different. The, the mood is different. Here, people are, you know, they don't. They're like Americans. Americans don't take anything easy either. <laughs> But people are intelligent, they're thoughtful here. They they like to think, they're they like they also like to read, but they don't easily accept things. So you have to be good. You have to be you have to really convince people here. It takes a it takes a little bit of work. Right? No? <laughs> The quality of intelligence is not to accept things so easily. Now that's one of the characteristics of intelligence. 
but there is a certain negativity that pervades that intelligence that I've noticed. So, you want to get through, you have to work at it. Mm -hmm. There's people who are intelligent or uh, who are optimistic, but there are people who are intelligent who are pessimistic. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, different kinds of intelligence. So my, my, this is not a criticism, it's just a fact that if here it takes some work. But once you convince somebody, they're convinced. Right, Mukunda? Am I wrong? You can add something? <laughs> well, there you go. That, that, that talks. Rishadam talks. <laughs> Yeah, and friendliness. People are not so openly friendly here, but if you become openly friendly to them, they somehow come out of their, their uh, what we say, standoffishness. People are reserved, and they're very thoughtful, very careful how they do things. But if you're open and you're, that's what I notice about Mukunda. He he doesn't give up. He's persistent, and therefore he makes a lot of he gets a lot of things done. <clears throat> Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's why I keep giving classes here. I'm hoping something will happen. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you. I hope I didn't say anything wrong. <laughs> you can correct me, Ananta, if I did. Like in Croatian, people are sentimental. And if you tell, you know, they, they'll take things really easy. But then again, after some time, they give it up so easy. They don't stay with things so easy. But here, somebody becomes, they get fixed, they stick with it. Mm -hmm. Because when you're intelligent, you eventually, um, you, you have to be convinced. When you're convinced by your intelligence, you're convinced. When you're convinced by, just by sentiment or situation, you might be receptive, but you, down deep you're not fully convinced yet. Mm -hmm. So we have to, especially in Croatia, Slovenia, you have to really be sharp here. <laughs> Take some work. <laughs> yeah? Am I wrong? Nobody's giving me any, they're not throwing anything at me yet, so. <laughs> You're never wrong? <laughs> if I believed that, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> it's like Danilo. We're trying to get him to, you know, find a guru, but he's working on it, right? Uh. You, ma you mentioned, you described that books often also uh, sells themselves or they go to from hand to hand and then end in some uh, yeah. sincere person. Yeah. And uh, A lot of times it, it doesn't make a difference in the person you give it to, but someone down the line gets it. And one of the devotees came up with the, an idea that uh, maybe we can send maybe a book or a sponsored book to some random address and put some nice letter of describing or some verse and also on a bill they, they can put a donation if they want not necessarily what is your opinion about that it's, it's an idea if you have an idea, and you got some idea how how it should work, do it. 
and see, just see the results. As Prabhupada said, if you're sincere and you're trying to figure out ways to distribute books, Krishna will help you. You don't have to look for the perfect formula. You just have to come up with some idea and then work at it. Krishna will do the rest. So you'll, you'll see how many people actually respond. And some people may not respond, but they'll keep the book and they'll read it. Or somebody will read it. And can we also use maybe these uh, stories, how one became a devotee, like you mentioned that one was ter a terminal uh, illness and then he turned. Yeah. And we can maybe use this like uh, it's not... I don't think that's a general preaching thing. Okay. Mm. These are more in-house stories, yeah. Okay. What about, I was also thinking, uh, I have an idea that maybe I could uh, wrote down a small article how, uh, like, uh, uh, when I read some book, how how it affects me or something that way. Uh, yeah, whatever ideas you have, connect it. Yeah, that sounds good. If you have, you mean some realization that you get from reading. Yeah. Personal realizations go a long way, generally. Krishna consciousness is about realizing the philosophy, realizing your relationship with Krishna, realizing the futility of material life. These are all different types of realizations. Okay, so happy birthday to to Ananta Dave. Today is his birthday. He's halfway through life. He's got another 50 years to go. <laughs> 50 down and 50 to go. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you're going to be temple president for 50 more years, but <laughs> you might want to retire in, in the last 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> the next 40. So we congratulate him for all the wonderful services he's done through the years that's made this temple a viable temple. As Beer Krishna Maharaj told me personally, this is one of the best temples in Europe. <laughs> and he said it with such surety. So it's a lot, a lot to do with uh, Anatta Prabhu's uh, ins spiritual inspiration. I don't know what he does for managing. I don't think he does any. But he's a spiritual inspirator for everyone in terms of Shastra, in terms of book distribution, in terms of Harinam, in terms of temple activities, pujas, and so many other things that are going on. And I'm sure he's, his management is also going on. But I see that he's an inspiration and an example for for the devotees and how to stay f enlivened in Krishna consciousness. So that's good. Thank you. You've done a wonderful job. I didn't think I would get locked down here, but somehow I did. <laughs> so I'm starting to appreciate my lockdown now. <laughs> I'm trying. I have a hard time saying no, when you ask me something. <laughs> but keep asking. <laughs> Did you like my uh, offering to you today? <laughs> I sent him a fork and a knife, a couple cakes and some fruit <laughs> by, uh, by virtual <laughs> media. <laughs> along with some real live edible mama <laughs> 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 
which was to compensate for the fact that I <laughs> I did everything by by cell phone before that. <laughs> So uh, congratulations for being, you know, who you are and how you've inspired this temple. Continue. And, of course, your association for me is so wonderful. Thank you. I really feel happy. When I come into the door and when I every night I look for the orange shoes and I think if there's the orange shoes are not there, what am I going to go in for? There's no, <laughs> there's, no, there's no reason to go in. <laughs> It's not an exaggeration, either. <laughs> so Madhatri, she told me about the birthday yesterday. I didn't know. So if there's any reason to blame, she's the one. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, and uh, distribute books. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada Ki Jai.